This journey began when I left the UK on my motorbike to go to my job as a petroleum engineer in Abu Dhabi. My route crossed Europe to Asia and into Turkey and Iran, then by Dao across the Arabian Gulf. The first of many ferries was a hovercraft to France. The route crossed hazardous mountain passes on dirt tracks and a beautiful run down the coast of communist Yugoslavia, past walled castles and island fortresses, to Istanbul where I crossed the Bosphorus to Asia, along some picturesque scenery, but I had a bad accident at 70 miles an hour in Turkey, fracturing my elbow, smashing the bike and bending its frame. After some more dangerous times in Turkey, I crossed into Iran, and here is my bike, a Triumph Bonneville, under the watchful eye of a hired security guard. I took a dhow across the Gulf, leaving the Iranian port of Bandar Abbas en route to Dubai. These dhows were infamous for smuggling gold and immigrants. The bike had to be lifted over the rail of the dhow. It was to be a long voyage in an open boat, but it was my only option. In the middle of the sea, another dhow came up alongside, and most of the passengers leapt across, probably illegal immigrants. The Dow navigated by sun and stars. I disembarked in Dubai and got stuck in the soft sand to Abu Dhabi as there was no road at the end of my 4,300 mile journey. Abu Dhabi at that time was little more than a fishing village. The oil wealth was yet to come. I was told that I was the first person to have made it overland by vehicle from Britain to Abu Dhabi. I travelled in a 4x4 on to work across the world's biggest Sabka salt flats, which were like porridge under a thin crust, to our bachelor camp at Tarif, which was the operations base for the oil fields. We worked 96 days on, non-stop, and 32 days off. There were just enough of us to muster a soccer team. A group of us crossed into Oman, which was a closed country, hardly known with no tourism and with tribal conflicts. Our party was made up of geologists and engineers, and we were keen to see the geology in this mountainous country, where the limestone reservoir rocks in Abu Dhabi were thrust to surface or exposed in deep river gorges. Water is a precious commodity and the women carry jugs of it elegantly on their heads. We negotiated some passes and many more river crossings, then got to this magnificent wadi or gorge. We headed back to the empty quarter, then on to Abu Dhabi. I climbed the Jebel Hafid with John Pooler. Again, the limestone was related to our oilfield reservoir, and the geology was interesting in this overthrust area. We were the second team to have ever scaled this peak. Once an oil well location had been set, it was necessary to find a route through the dunes, which were often impassable. This big red slip face would be impassable to most vehicles, and impassable to all vehicles in the upwind or northwesterly direction. These slip faces make dull roaring sounds when driven. One night I was stranded after my Land Rover was rolled over and later rescued. Here is a slip face several hundred feet high. The bigger ones in the south towards the middle of the Rubel Kali get up to 1,000 feet high, as big as any worldwide. Here, geologist Chris Rivet Karnak is planning a route through the dunes. Desert driving requires great skill, being able to read the hard and soft sand. Trying to walk to safety after an accident was very dangerous. We carried 10 gallons of water in each Land Rover and tanked tracks to help getting unstuck. Driving with low tire pressures down to 6 psi was key in difficult areas. Here I am reducing the tire pressure. And here is the toughest challenge, going upwind into the dune faces. Here is one of our engineers arriving at a wellhead. Knife edges and blowholes were hazards. Sandstorms were also perilous. The drilling rigs were moved in packages by huge Kenworth six-wheel drive trucks. 
Here the substructure is being moved by two Kenworths side by side, with support from two dozers pushing from behind. The 120-foot drilling derrick was moved by three Kenworths, requiring much skill from the Bedou drivers. The porter cabin camp was moved in a few big loads. Our workforce was very small, spread over a very large area, and we were told that we produce more oil per person than any other oil company worldwide. We were discovering more giant oil fields every year, and there was a feeling that it was limitless. One of our well locations was on an island. Unfortunately, one of the key power skids sank. I was contacted to organize a rescue of the skid, as I had the only air compressor for scuba diving in the country. Each well could be drilled in 10 to 20 days to 9,000 feet. Drilling hazards included lost circulation, stuck pipe, fishing, kicks and blowouts. Safety on the rig floor was important as huge hunks of steel slammed into each other. These are the mud pumps, the heart of the rig. Mud is pumped to the drilling bit at the bottom of the hole, and it circulates back up the annulus, carrying drilled cuttings with it. Under the rig floor are the blowout preventers, bolted to the wellhead. Drilled cuttings come over the shale shaker, giving geologists information about the rocks being drilled. Several times on each well, the drill string has to be pulled out of the hole in 90-foot stands to change the drilling bit, or to run casing, and on reaching total depth. At total depth, electric wireline logs were run, and we often got the thrill of being the first to see evidence of oil discovered downhole. Now we are running casing, which protects the well against collapse, lost circulation, blowout, and stuck pipe. Work on these drilling rigs continues 24-365 with at most one hour shutdown once per year to eat Christmas lunch. These wells provide fuel for heating, power and transportation across Europe and Asia. Few people know the hard work and risks taken by the oil industry to make this happen. After casing is run, cement is pumped down hole and up the casing annulus to seal it in place. Cement quality is monitored throughout the operation. When the well is complete, all the drill pipe is laid down, allowing the derrick to be lowered and the rig moved to the next location.
Many of the wells needed completion operations by smaller rigs. This rig got stuck and nearly rolled over. My home for 96 days at a time was at this camp. The strong Shamal wind often hit us. Many of the operations were for well stimulation, typically 200,000 gallon acid joints. We sometimes cooled off in this water tank as air temperatures soared to over 130 degrees Fahrenheit. The rig and camp were often set in basins to allow better access for water wells, but made them very hot under radiation from the sun. On completion, wells were often production tested, this one at 30,000 barrels of oil per day. Finally, a flow line was laid from the well to the production station, often raised to reduce temperatures. At the production station, gas was separated and oil pumped underground to tankers off the coast. This story captures the flavour for the frontier operations in the early developments in the Middle East. <laughs>